So I thought I would uh, take the first uh, couple of minutes reviewing uh, genetics uh, while we talked about last time. Uh, maybe going over um, uh, a little bit more how important uh, the genes are and the fact that we've been talking about uh, metabolism and cell structure and uh, microbial growth and all of those really have to do with the genes of the micro. You know, the genes are kind of uh, the book, if you will, of the organism. And the environment is the reader in interpreting that book. <clears throat> if we look at our microbe here, imagine our microbe, and then we were to look at its DNA, its genetic sequence here, Remember that it's circular. And then, when we look at it closely, what we might find, what we would find, is that various regions of this molecule code for specific proteins. Well, what we mean when we say code for specific proteins is that this DNA sequence So if I were to take this piece of DNA right here, this DNA sequence, is composed of nucleotides that are written in a triplet code, so that each triplet of nucleotides <coughs> equals a specific amino acid or codes for a specific amino acid. Our messenger RNA reads this nucleotide sequence, transcribes it, if you will, into a language that can be converted into amino acids. These messenger RNAs then convert this DNA sequence into a sequence of amino acids. And as that sequence of amino acids is being built, it will fold in on itself based on the sequence of amino acids. Depending on where they go, they'll fold and form bonds and other things like that. And what that will do is create a protein or an enzyme that has an active site. And that active site is where the protein reacts with the substrate. It binds specifically to a molecule and carries out the reaction with that molecule, either anabola, anabolism or cannibalism, catabolism, not cannibalism, uh, <clears throat> causing the reaction to occur. So the sequence here then is responsible for all of the proteins and enzymes that uh, cells will have. And that means then that located on the membrane where we find proteins that are embedded for cellular respiration, proteins that are embedded that allow for molecules to move through because they serve as channels and stuff, these proteins that are here are a result of the genetic sequence for that micro. And so, <clears throat> the significance of that is, if you mess up that sequence some way, you change the nucleotides, either because of a base substitution or some other kind of trans uh, replication error, that could change this protein such that it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So instead of being a protein that's involved in cellular respiration, maybe now it doesn't function like it should, and so cellular respiration is impacted here. This microbe doesn't carry that out. Or maybe it's a protein that's involved in the transport of a molecule across the membrane. Okay? If this mutation occurs such that now the sequence of amino acids that's put together 
is different and the protein folds up so that the active site is no longer functional, then whatever function that protein carried out doesn't happen and it could severely impact the cell. Many times, most times, mutations that change the protein active site cause enough damage that that cell doesn't reproduce, doesn't divide and dies. And so a lot of times mutations that lead to the death of the cell don't get passed on to new cells. They're, they sim simply end. Every once in a while though, a mutation will lead to a amino acid sequence that causes the folding of a protein or an enzyme that allows the active site to react with a substrate that maybe it didn't do before. So now you have a completely new enzyme or protein that might allow you an advantage, might give you an advantage. Maybe it allows you to utilize a specific uh, a sugar source that you couldn't use before. All of the metabolic processes that we've talked about, like colysis, the trichroboxylic acid cycle, the electron transport chain, all of them use enzymes. And if you affect those enzymes in any way so that they don't function, you affect that pathway. And ultimately, you can affect the microbe. Imagine now if we can develop drugs that can interfere in any one of these processes. If we can interfere with a particular uh, gene, it's maybe uh, deleterious. Maybe we use a virus to serve as a vector to interrupt that gene. You know, something like that. If we can interfere with the messenger RNA sequence, maybe we don't interfere with the gene, but we develop something that blocks transcription. Or maybe we can block the development of the amino acid sequence, interfere with transfer RNA. Or maybe we can block the active site of the protein. A number of different ways that we could potentially interfere with the microbe's ability to reproduce, its ability to cause infection. Any questions? Yeah. So we give the drug to block the, the what? Well, well, depends on the drug. The drug would have to be very specific and it's only going to block one thing. Maybe you interfere with the DNA replicating, maybe you interfere with uh, RNA transcription, maybe you interfere with amino acid translation. Any one of those pathways, if you can interfere with them, you can stop or inhibit the growth of the microbe. Um, professor, so the folding of the amino acid, sequence of amino acid, or protein enzyme, enzyme, would it cause the death of the cell? Are proteins and enzymes. Enzymes are proteins. So, <clears throat> all amino acid sequences that fold are proteins, okay? Some of those proteins are structural, like bricks, and they're used for building. But some of those proteins are enzymes, they're, catal they're, they're um, catalysts, they cause reactions to occur. So that's, that's all I'm saying here. The amino acid sequence is generated, a protein or an enzyme is, is formed from that DNA sequence. So, in 1985, a gentleman by the name of Richard Lenski from Michigan State University began a 20-year study looking at E. coli. Now, he chose E. coli. One's a classic organism to study, and we know quite a bit about it. Very common. Estimate there is 100 billion billion E. coli cells on the planet. 100 billion billion E. coli cells. You have about a billion E. coli cells in your intestine alone. Okay. Most cases, E. coli is harmless. There are a few exceptions to that, a few strains that, that can cause disease, but most cases they're harmless. Now, if we assume that a mutation happens every one in a billion times, okay, in E. coli. They have 59 genes total. That means that, that in, uh, 
every gene, every day, a mutation will occur somewhere on this planet for E. coli. Okay, so we gotta think about the dynamics of that. That means that microbe is experiencing a mutation in every one of its genes every day somewhere on the planet. Okay, so there's a chance for new proteins, new enzymes. Now, like I said, in most cases, those mutations that occur probably lead to the death of the cell. Every once in a while, a mutation will happen that gives the cell an advantage. <clears throat> well, because bacteria uh, reproduce by binary fission, it means that we can grow large populations easily. And then we can actually get several generations over a short period of time. So what Minsky did is he took a strain of E. coli and he put it into 12 flasks of a nutrient agar medium. I'm not going to draw 12, I'm just going to put six up here. <clears throat> but each one of these flasks then were started with cells that were genetically identical coming from the same strain, the same colony, if you will. He used the nutrient broth, and the only fuel source was glucose. The only fuel source for the microbes was glucose. So he kept these lines separate for 20 years, and every day he would take one mil from the culture and transfer it into a new uh, batch of media to keep the culture going. So if you, were, if you think about our growth curve in the bacterial setting, his transfer happened probably right about here, where the cells are now starved for nutrients. In situations like that, you have a tendency to induce mutations because of the uh, circumstances of the environment now. Replication might be hampered a little bit. The uh, ability to make corrections to DNA might be affected by the lack of nutrients that are there. So <clears throat> you have this kind of bonanza situation followed by a starving situation for the cultures. And every day he would transform, transfer one male to a new culture. In addition to that, he would grab a sample and freeze it every 500 generations. So, <clears throat> in that way he was keeping a fossil record of any changes that might be taking place in the population over time. He got about six to seven generations a day. Uh, equal to about 45,000 generations over the, the time of the study. That's equal to about a million years of human evolution. So he's looking at about a million years of uh, time for evolution. What you would expect when you set up this situation is that natural selection would favor mutations that would take advantage of the glucose. And so we would see, hopefully, that the cells would get better at using the glucose and maybe grow bigger because of their efficiency at using the glucose. That's exactly what happened. <clears throat> Within about 200 generations, this is over time, and this is number of cells, What Lenski observed was that in about 200 generations, we see that the cells have mutated to the point that they are growing at a faster rate than they did prior to this setup. They mutated, or mutations occurred, such that they became better at using the glucose in their environment. The cells became more efficient at using the glucose. They grew better. But what he noticed was that the changes that took place were different changes in each of the 12 lines. 
He didn't see the same mutations leading to the same results. Different mutations led to the cells getting bigger. All 12 lines got better, more efficient at using the glucose that was in the environment. But not only that, they didn't just get better and more efficient at using the glucose, they got bigger too. Over time, they saw the cells increase in size. Now not all of the cells took the same route. Some flasks maybe got there sooner. Other flasks took a different approach. But all 12 lines got more efficient at using the glucose and they got bigger. The cells got bigger. And when he looked at those fossil records, he did genetic sequencing of the microbes from these cultures. Every 5,000 generations, he was taking a sample. So he had a genetic record. And what he saw was that they all took different routes, but they all achieved the same thing. There were different mutations, different combinations of mutations that led to the cells getting larger 